Morning. If I can have everybody's attention, I'd like to call to order uh, this meeting. Welcome to the meeting of the Oklahoma Aerospace Aeronautics Commission, March 6, 2024. The meeting notice was posted according to the requirements of the Open Meeting Act. This meeting will come to order. Call the roll, please. First Congressional District Commissioner Seth Phillips. Here. Second Congressional District Commissioner Secretary Kevin Potter. Third Congressional District Commissioner Chairman Charles Ortega. Fourth Congressional District Commissioner Lindy Ritz. Fifth Congressional District Commissioner Vice Chair Blake Rainey. Here. At large Commissioner Jim Putnam. Here. At large Commissioner Jerry Hunter. Here. We have a quorum. Our next order of business is the approval of the minutes. The draft of the minutes of the January 30th, 2024 commission meeting has been sent to you and a copy is in your meeting packet. Are there any corrections to the minutes as distributed? If there are no uh, corrections, I will accept motions to approve the minutes as distributed. Do we have a motion? A second. Commissioner Phillips. Abstain. Vice Chair Rainey. Aye. Commissioner Putnam. Abstain. Commissioner Hunter. Aye. Okay, the motion uh, passes. Next item uh, for aviation art contest. Sandra. Good morning, commissioners. The Oklahoma Department of Aerospace and Aeronautics, in conjunction with the National Association of State Aviation Officials, conducted the International Avi Aviation Art Contest for 2024. This was a unique opportunity for students to showcase their talents and display their artwork through the exciting world of aviation. The art contest encouraged students from Oklahoma ages 6 to 17 to reflect on aviation by having them design their artwork based upon this year's chosen theme, Air Sports for a Peaceful World. The many people around the world who participate in air sports enjoy meeting new friends in new places. Air sports such as aerobatics, aeromodeling, airships, amateur built and experimental aircraft, balloons, drones, gliding, hand gliding, helicopters, man powered flying, micro lights, parachuting, paragliding, paramotors, and power flying all have the power to contribute to a peaceful society by bringing people together. Practicing these sports doesn't only mean knowing how to fly an aircraft or jump from an airplane or even acquiring new skills, breaking records and winning competitions. These activities also give us the opportunity to develop our social skills and help us to learn a sense of solidarity, friendship and patience on and off the airfield. The, art year, the artwork this year was judged in each of the three age classes based on originality, design, and usage of theme. First, second, third place winners from each group were chosen as well as an honorable, honorable mention category. Winners today will receive a certificate and a cash prize, and each piece of winning art we, artwork were judged at the national and international level. The judging was conducted by representatives from the Oklahoma Department of Aerospace and Aeronautics. The Oklahoma Department of Aerospace and Aeronautics is proud to host the Oklahoma 2024 International Aviation Art Contest. First place winners in each of the three age categories receive $200, while the second place winners receive $150. A cash prize of $100 is presented to students who place third, and honorable mention will receive $50. The top three entries in each age division were forwarded to Washington, D.C., where they competed nationally against other winners from the U.S. for the right to advance to the international competition. The national winners were announced in March and have been submitted for the 2024 International Aviation Art Contest, which will be judged in June by the Federation Aeronautic International. The 2024 International Aviation Art Contest is sponsored in large part by the National Aeronautic Association, uh, Federation Aeronautic International, National Association of State Aviation Officials, Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University, National Coalition for Aviation and Space Education, and the Federal Aviation Administration and the Ken Cook Company. Commissioners, it's our pleasure and privilege to present to you your 2024 Art Contest winners. And we will start with the junior division. Would you please welcome our first place winner, Envika Menon, um, third grade Washington Irving Elementary. And Envika could not be here today. She is in class, but uh, we wanted to recognize her and we will mail her certificate to her and her um, monetary prize as well. The second place winner was 
Samantha Vith Street Vatsava, third grade, Dove School of Discovery. They are also not with us today. Third place is Elisa Park, fourth grade, Roosevelt Elementary School. She is with us. Would you please welcome her? In our honorable, honorable mention category, Emily Ann Kimball, from fourth, fourth grader from Marietta School, is with us today. In the intermediate division, uh, first place was Jamie Kang, an eighth grader from Whittier Middle School, and she is with us today. Please welcome to the podium Jake Park, sixth, sixth grader from Whittier Middle School, and he won second place. Third place went to Sam Bruth Street Vatsava, from a sixth grader from Doug School of so School of Discovery. He is not with us today, but honorable mention went to Kaysen R. Lewis, fifth grader from Crossings Christian School. Commissioners in our senior division, first place went to Jaylee Tamano, ninth grader from Lawton High School. She is not here today. Uh, second place went to Jalissa Claudefelder, a 10th grader from Warner High School. She's come a long way to be with us today. Please welcome her. Third place is Zoe Torix, a 10th grader from Warner High School. In that category, honorable mention went to Nathan Bird, a 10th grader from Warner High School. Commissioners, that concludes our presentation today. We um, want to thank everyone who entered the contest next year and really encourage those schools to do so again uh, next year. And uh, just want to thank everybody for coming today. I know a lot of people traveled very far. Commissioner Rainey, I yield for any questions. No, we're good. Thank you, Commissioners. Thank you for doing it, Sandra. Thank you, Sandra. The look at each one of those drawings, they were so unique and special. And each one of you guys have so many gifts and skills, it's gonna be exciting to see how you put them to use. So um, you guys are more than welcome to stay for the rest of the meeting, or if you'd like to leave at this time, we'll give you, give you a moment to step out, so. There goes the rope. Thank you all.
All right, next item is the financial report. Chris, you recognized? Good morning, Commissioners. We'll note that the financial reports this month are going to be as of January 31st. We've having our meeting a little earlier in the month. Uh, we just didn't have all the February numbers in, especially from the Tax Commission on our revenue. So. Starting out with the financial summary document, as of January 31st, the department had an ending cash balance of $22.6 million, with encumbrances totaling just over $15 million. Estimated statutory revenue for the remainder of FY24 is about $5 million, and outstanding reimbursements owed to the agency is approximately $1 million. The total amount of remaining expenditures that could be incurred this fiscal year, which goes through the end of June, totals $18.9 million, with the bulk of that being approximately $17.6 million in the airport construction program assuming that those grants are approved. Leaves us with an expected available cash balance after encumbrances and expected income of negative 5.3. I know I sound like a broken record for the last couple months, but that will not happen. That assumes that every project is awarded and paid in full by the end of June. We know that won't happen. That's not feasible. So it um, does show, though, that the additional revenue we've received both last year and continue to receive this year, we are putting that right back into projects. and. Nick will uh, share with you all later all the other projects we're adding to it. Total fiscal year-to-date expenditures are $4.6 million as of the end of January. Moving on to the revenue document, total statutory revenue collected for the month of January was about $2.2 million. That was led by $2.1 million in aircraft excise tax. Um, it was not a single plane that accounted for that like we see so often. Uh, it was multiple planes throughout the month that just added up to that, so good to see. That trend continue. Total statutory revenue collected through January this fiscal year was about $6.8 million, which compares to about $6.6 .6 million for last year. So we're up about 2% year over year through January. Then on the three-year average revenue document, uh, revenue collected this fiscal year from registration fees, excise tax, fuel tax, and license plates is currently about $2.7 million more than our three-year average. I will note, though, that three-year average um, started in FY21, which we were still coming out of COVID impacts at that point, so that definitely drags those numbers down a little bit. With that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Chris. The next order of business is item six, legislative congressional and regulatory update. Sandra. Thank you, Chairman Rainey. Director Artes is testifying this morning at the general government and transportation appropriations hearing and he uh, is on his way now. They have concluded their business. So I'm going to give you a brief overrun. I, I um, passed out to the dais information. Um, so if you'll look at this right here. This is the bill tracking sheet. Um, last week concluded the hearing in the House of Origin for bills legislation and about 2,500 bills have gone through the legislative process. And so now we have um, several pieces of legislation that are now dormant or dead for the year because this year is concluding the second legislature year of the 59th legislature. And uh, I just wanted to point out some points of interest to you. Um, House Bill 3426. Um, restores a tax credit for investments in a qualified space transportation vehicle provider until tax year 2029. This bill was brought by the Oklahoma Department of Commerce and uh, State Representative Nick Archer, who has OSIDA in his district. So we are watching that legislation to see if that is going to prevail in the Senate. House Bill 3430 is the committee substitute that renames Title III of the Oklahoma statutes as aerospace, aircraft, and aviation infrastructure. Director Artes asked that Representative Archer carry this legislation with Senator Haste to update the title in our statute, which is Title III. House Bill 3670. Uh, is cleanup language by Representative Nicole Miller for the engineer tax credits. We are once again trying to work with the Oklahoma Tax Commission to make sure that um, engineers are able to exercise their tax credit, their five-year tax credit. And so we are working with the Tax Commission. I think that we've got a, a solution worked out, and so we're just going to codify that in language. House Bill 3672. Um, provides the definition of a VTOL aircraft, which is aircraft that is the ability to take off and land vertically, and uh, a vertiport, which is the area of land used for the takeoff and landing of VTOL aircraft. This is part of our strategic plan for UAS and unmanned, integrating them into the airspace. House Bill 4072 introduce, 
introduced allows a person who previously qualified for the Aerospace Engineer Employee Tax Credit to be able to claim the credit again. And that is by Chairman Wallace and Miller. Senate Bill 1294 authorizes the establishment of the nonprofit Oklahoma Aerospace Foundation. This is being carried by Senator Paul Racino. You might recall that the um, director has brought this to your attention that we are looking to start a 501c3, which is something that the OSBI, the Department of Wildlife, and several other agencies have. This will allow us to accept um, donations in the form of aircraft engines, things that we can get to Oklahoma schools and directly send uh, monetary or um, tangible items to the schools that Paula is working with. Senate Bill 1338 creates the Oklahoma Department of Commerce Progressing Rural Economic Prosperity Revolving Fund under the management of the Department of Commerce. And we're looking at this, Senate Bill 1338 allows us to extend the funds for PrEP funds. You know, uh, Nick and Chris and uh, Nick's team have been working on getting those, those projects done. And so uh, there is an expiration on those funds. And so uh, Senator Roger Thompson is working on making sure that those funds do not expire. Senate Bill 1372 creates the Oklahoma Aircraft Engine Testing Development Grant Program within the Oklahoma Department of Aerospace and Aeronautics. This is to create an engine test cell program for businesses that are looking to um, test large aircraft engines. And we are working with Tulsa International Airport um, on a space for that. And uh, there is a match required. And, and that would be administered through the Oklahoma Department of Aerospace and Aeronautics. I'm happy to answer any questions on that. That's um, being run by um, Senator Haste. Senate Bill 1393 creates the Long-Term Aerospace and Aeronautics Infrastructure Sustainability Re Revolving Fund. This is, again, something that uh, the legislature is working with Chris on to make sure that our funds do not expire before we get our projects completed. Senate Bill 1411 expands a qualified employee as it relates to quality jobs tax credit. And this is another engineer tax credit bill being run by Senator Pugh. So there's one in the House and one in the Senate. And uh, they are both working with the Oklahoma Tax Commission to get those issues resolved. Senate Bill 1490 clarifies that the credit for qualified employees in the aerospace sector shall be limited to five consecutive tax years. Okay, that's the engineer tax credit. We just did that one. Okay, Senate Bill 1494 lowers the qualification threshold for the expansion of aircraft maintenance facilities as they relate to the sales tax exemption for the purchase of computers, data processing equipment, related peripherals, and telephone, telegraph, or telecommunication services and equipment from $5 million to $2 million, as well as the employee requirement from 250 to 120 25 full-time employees. That's being carried by Senator Rader, and so we are in conversations with him about his intent of the language. Senate Bill 1912 adds references to vertiports to the provision of the Municipal Airports Act, and that is by Senator Haste. Some things that did not prevail coming through the legislature, there was um, a bill introduced last year about laser pointers at aircraft, and so these are just some things I wanted to bring to your attention as you read through this. Um, you will see over here the update on the right-hand side. And uh, if you have any questions about that, the green in your spreadsheet are the bills that have cleared the committee process. So I am happy to yield for any questions by the commission. Comments, questions? No. All right, uh, next up is item seven, the review of upcoming aviation and aerospace events. Sandra, uh, please continue. Sorry, commissioners. Thank you. Uh, next slide, please, Caitlin. So this is um, the 2024 Master Events Calendar. Uh, I just wanted to bring some things to your attention. Um, April 3rd is Aero Oklahoma. That is our advocacy day at the state capitol for aerospace, aeronautics, and defense. We uh, have a robust agenda planned, and we'll have several um, ambassador teams going around. I know Commissioner Putnam has previously gone with our pilots. So Commissioner Putnam will be calling on you again if you need. Okay, and uh, wanted to also point out to you, Aero Week is April 1st through 6th. You might remember that we're working with the Innovation District to bring an entire um, Aerospace Week events. And uh, so within that, there is going to be, I'm pretty sure there's gonna be a groundbreaking at AAR on April 5th for the hangar there, their expansion. Um, 
April 11th, the Oklahoma National Guard is hosting a student flight fest, and we have a fantastic relationship with the National Guard. Paula Keedy has done a great job of cultivating that um, relationship with them. And the next day, April 12th, is Enid Student Flight Day, so our team will be at both events with our booth and connecting with students there. Um, April 26th is the OK Aero Connect networking event at Tulsa Air and Space Museum. And April 27th is Tulsa's Girls in Aviation Day. Caitlin and I will be there for that. And June 3rd through 7th is the AOPA Spring Training. And we are working on a location. Paula is working uh, with several entities to secure a great venue for that. And uh, she, I'm sure she'll update you more about that in her report. Um, the Women in Aviation Oklahoma City Chapter is looking to have an event at the Governor's Mansion on uh, around um, August 19th, which is Oklahoma Aviation and Aerospace Day in tandem with National Aviation and Aerospace Day. Um, the Thunderbird Drone Festival um, is something that the Oklahoma Department of Aerospace and Aeronautics is excited to partner with this year. So Ms. Ms. Caitlin over here is going to be uh, working on that. and. Uh, also, Girls in Aviation Day is going to be at Wiley Post at the Atlantic Hangar, Hangar 5. And Oklahoma Women in Aviation and Aerospace Day will be um, December 5th through 6th this year in Tulsa. So I would yield for any questions. Uh, to those watching online, please send us your events. We want to make sure that those are posted to our social media channels, and I would yield for any questions. Wow. Thank you. Sandra, thank you. Item number eight is the Aerospace and Aviation Education Update. Paula. Good morning, Commissioners. As always, I'm really happy to be here to discuss some of the work that the Department has done to propel aviation education uh, across the state. First of all, last month I told you about a new field testing project we're doing called the Bessie Coleman After School Aviation All-Stars. It's kind of a mouthful. Uh, and as always with a field test, that would indicate that we're just trying to see how this would work if we were to you know, increase it next year. We have three schools, Weatherford Public School, Pryor Public School, and Springdale Elementary of the Tulsa Public Schools. Uh, the concerning thing was that Gigi Coleman is in Chicago. You see Gigi there on the Zoom screen. Uh, her office is in Chicago, so she gets the guest speakers and brings them to the students through Zoom. We've had, today will be the third Bessie Coleman after school uh, all-star meeting with the kids. And quite frankly, it's been outstanding. I, I was a little nervous about it, but it has been very, very good. Last week, uh, our new education coordinator, Stephanie Holt and I, uh, Lucas and I, were in prior to be there in person for the event. Uh, the kids heard from an American Airlines pilot, uh, a Southwest pilot, uh, from Chicago, O'Hare, and uh, we're really excited to, to be able to ask questions. They were brave and they asked questions over the Zoom meeting. And then after that, each week, the students will do a hands-on, high engaging activity having to do with aviation. And so they, this week, past week, they learned the parts of the airplane and they had a, the styrofoam plane and learned the parts. And one little girl came up to me afterwards and she said, ma'am, I'm sorry to have to ask this, but could I possibly take this airplane home? And I said, yes, you can possibly take that airplane home. And she was so excited. So it's fun for us to see the light go on in their eyes. Uh, this week, those kids are actually going to their local airports. So they're going to Tulsa International and to Weatherford and to prior airports uh, on a field trip as part of the after school program. Our hope is that we will continue next year to be able to add schools to this. At, at three, the bell rings at 3.30, they go to their locker, they get a snack, they come to the room and at 3.50, the speakers uh, welcome them and talk to them about careers. So it's a 10-week program, and we're really happy to be able to move it forward in our schools. Secondly, I'd like to talk about this past weekend, the department uh, partnered with Oklahoma State University for a UAS drone professional development for our uh, Oklahoma teachers. We had just under 60 teachers there. Uh, Dr. Jamie Jacob and the OAR team, uh, I just cannot thank them enough for the work they did on this outstanding program. The teachers built a drone, they flew drones, they heard uh, guest speakers from OAR and got to bond with each other and talk about and share 
things. Stillwater Public Schools was also involved and opened their venues to us to be able to fly uh, inside uh, on Saturday morning and Saturday afternoon. So we're very appreciative of that. Uh, thirdly, the school visits are continuing, as you can see by the list there. Uh, I did meet with the Edmond Public School counselors, as I told you last month, all three Edmond High Schools have joined uh, for next year for the AOPA curriculum, so that's a positive. I did meet with all their counselors to talk about credits and uh, how that would move forward for them, so that was a good me meeting. On February 8th, I met with Watonga Public School Superintendent and the w Watonga Airport uh, Manager, actually, and um, I believe they will plan to move forward next year as well. On the 9th, I went with uh, Board of Regent Connie Riley to Okima Public School. She was very interested in her area uh, being coming involved with the curriculum, and so I was glad and happy to meet her there as a, a, a regent. She also was very concerned about pathways and how do you get these students from high school into college, and so it was my pleasure to join her there. Uh, on the 13th, Kingston Public Schools. On the 23rd, uh, our team went to meet with Dr. Sean McDaniel of the Oklahoma City Public Schools. It was a very positive meeting. Uh, I believe he is going to establish some further meetings with his STEM team with us. Uh, I already know that John Marshall High School is planning to implement uh, next year, so we're hopeful that other Oklahoma City Public Schools will get on board as well. Um, on the 27th, I visited Oklahoma Christian School in Edmond, and that afternoon, Perry Public Schools and the Perry Public School Superintendent. And then yesterday, Stephanie and I had the chance to go to Indiahoma down between Lawton and Altus, a very small school, and then followed that with a meeting at Cameron University on how they could perhaps move forward in helping these schools and, and c continue this pathway. We're to the point now where this, some of the schools are making it through the end of the AOPA curriculum pathway, and they need to know what happens next. Where do these kids go? And so we're working uh, with them on that. As Sandra mentioned, we are planning the AOPA summer training. This will be the third year in a row that AOPA will come to us rather than our teachers going to trying to get to Frederick, Maryland for the training. Uh, we are working on the venue. Uh, part of the problem has been the motel a situation, hotel situation, or lack thereof due to the softball World Series. So uh, we're trying to lock that down and get that in place for June 3 through 6, and probably we'll have around 80 Oklahoma teachers there. So that is the education report, and obviously be delighted to answer any questions you might have. Questions, comments? Will there be any chance of going to OU and putting them up in uh, Norman? Well, you know, we've had it at OU visited, I believe, last summer or the summer before during the training. Uh, we outgrew the spot we were in really? because our number of teachers. Um, it, you know, that is a possibility, and, and maybe some dorm situation might work. But we are exploring. Several people have volunteered their venues, which is a positive thing. We're just trying to get the logistics worked out. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank, Thank you. you. Next item, item nine, introduction of new staff members, Director Ortiz. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and commissioners. Uh, apologize for my tardiness. Today was a day, wish I could have cloned myself to be over at the Capitol and doing uh, good business for a uh, new, new Senate process there with their Appropriations and Budget Committee, but uh, I'm here now, so you have my full and undivided attention. We have a, a couple of new, uh, new staff members that uh, I'd like to introduce to you all. Um, Got a wonderful uh, a new executive assistant. Uh, I obviously am, am most happy uh, about that, but I think the staff is too, because I was probably running a little ragged as uh, other duties as assigned, part-time executive assistant roles. But uh, Tanya uh, Sabalos comes to us from a, a long line of uh, executive assistant experience at Paycom and Hobby Lobby, uh, and she's, uh, she's doing a good job uh, one month on the job now, uh, as of today. So uh, Tanya, you want to? come up and say a few words. Good morning. Um, so hi, just want to introduce myself. Um, you guys all have my cell phone number, right? So call me or text me if you need me for anything. 
Um, like director already said, I've got a really long history of executive support. Um, this is my first government job, so I am trying to learn all of that. It's a pretty big uh, jump from the private sector jumping into government, but um, I'm confident that I'll learn it all uh, and just I'm really happy to be here. So thank you guys. And uh, as you all know, Tanya serves as Secretary of the Commission. So yes, please reach out to her with any questions, uh, comments, concerns uh, that you may have. Next up uh, on the list, we have uh, a new uh, aerospace education coordinator, of course, to help the uh, burgeoning uh, aero education program here at the agency. Uh, obviously, you heard with Paula's report, she's doing some uh, great things uh, across the state, but uh, we, we tried cloning Paula first. That didn't work. And so uh, I think we got the next best thing in Stephanie Holt Lucas, uh, long lineage and history of uh, public school education. Uh, McAllister, as you all know, McAllister is one of our uh, prime uh, AOPA schools, have been uh, with us not quite as long as Ada, but almost as long as Ada uh, has been teaching the program. So, uh, Stephanie, why don't you come up and tell us a little about yourself? Good morning. Hello. Uh, nice to meet you all. <clears throat> um, I knew when I took this job that I was taking a leap of faith. I've been in education for 35 years in public ed and what a great uh, experience that was, but took a leap of faith by joining the agency and it has been an adventure in the seven days I've been on board. Uh, from Edmond to Perry to Pryor to Stillwater, to India Homa, to Lawton. Um, I've already traversed Oklahoma Highway several, several hundred miles on behalf of the department. And I've done things already in that short time, like flying drones. I took a discovery flight and took control in the air. I mean, I'm doing things that I never imagined doing. And, but the best thing about all of it was um, getting the opportunity to work with the team, to work with Oklahoma teachers, educators last weekend at Stillwater. That's what I love best and am most passionate about. And I just look forward to contributing in that work with the department. And so I'm so happy to be here and nice to meet you all. Welcome. Thank you. We're glad you're here. Welcome both of you to the team. And, uh, Mr. Chairman, that uh, concludes my item nine. Okay. Uh, we'll just m move to 13. Yes. Okay. Okay, uh, we're going to pivot from the uh, agenda here and uh, move on to item number 13, uh, fiscal year 2025-2029, five-year airport construction program, Nick Young. Get my water ready. I'm going to need this. So thank you and good morning, commissioners. Uh, this time of year here in March is whenever we like to present to you all our recommended additions and modifications to the existing airport construction program as we move into the next fiscal year. And so right, what we're looking for today is to, one, put these in front of you to let you know what our recommendations are, and then from here, looking for a, an action to move into, th into the public comment period uh, for whenever we get ready to present this for final approval at the May Commission meeting. Uh, I will say that uh, just kind of, I don't want to take too much time on the front end because I have 59 slides to go through here. Uh, which on average I think is closer to 25 or 30. But uh, that tells you, one, the amount of uh, just attention our industry has gotten across the state. Uh, obviously our funding situation is a lot different than whenever I first started looking to basically program about four to five million dollars of agency funding and partnering that with about 13 million dollars worth of FAA funding every single year. Um, I haven't had a normal year yet here at this agency since I've come on board in late 2019 which isn't a bad thing, but I want to take a second to acknowledge the process that we've gone through to get to this point. I know and recognize that you all know that we're all busy at the agency, but I want to take a se second to recognize my staff. Uh, some of them don't even realize what all their part is in building this, uh, this ACP, but every comment we get during 5010 inspections, hey, we need to look at a crack cell in the near future for this. Uh, all the conversations that Grayson and I have at our airport visits with CIP meetings going over that to partner with local funds and projects that they want to get done with FAA funding alone that we may see an opportunity to go in and uh, be a cost-effective additive to that proposition to get a full scope done or to keep from going to a second phase. So I wanted to take first a second to say this is the culmination of our system plan documentation that we've gone through with that update here in the recent years, the economic impact study we did in 2017, which we're getting ready to go and do that again. 
And then, of course, the airport pavement management system that Ben so <laughs> is so dedicated at keeping up with, and our guys and our inspectors go out and do a heck of a job getting all that information at all of our airports. So I wanted to say all that before I dive into my slides here. Some of these I will brush over because they are pretty straightforward, 95.5 straight propositions for seal coats, those types of things. But please, at any time, stop me. I'd be happy to have conversations about any of these, but we we'll want to make sure that I'm also courteous of your time this morning. At Ada Regional Airport for this first uh, project that we have before you, this is a modification to an existing project, really just looking to shift our focus from an existing hangar area to uh, opening up the development area further south. So our portion of this isn't, it's not changing to anything existing, but they have added some additional FAA funds that, for that at a total cost of about 889000 In addition to that, we are seeking to add this project at Ada once we get the taxi lane uh, in place is to go after some T hangers. They have some older T hangers to the north. Uh, honestly, taking up some really good real estate for them that have exceeded their useful life to this point, and looking to reopen or kind of re transition those tenants to the south, and look for some business opportunities that uh, are interested in that area to that north. So this would be to construct T hangers as part of our hangar program. Again, this assumes that our level of funding going forward in the calendar year 2027 uh, it, it behooves us to move forward with this project. Obviously, if the funding is not there, our sponsors know that everything that we're doing is conditional upon what our budget looks like at that point in time. Total project cost on this anticipated to be about a $2.5 million cost. Uh, the department share at 40% at uh, about a $1 million. And next at Alva Regional Airport, they're seeking to add phase two of this project. Uh, again, this is just to get the rest of this stuff done uh, according to what we've seen here with the first phase and uh, trying to get that to a complete, um, con completed construction project, partnering with some FAA funds there at a 5% uh, match for us at $100,000. This is one of the crack seal and seal coat ad ad additions that we're looking to put in at Air Nadarko Municipal. This is a 95.5 proposition in the 25-26 time frame. Uh, this is all according to our APMS, our airport pavement management system that Ben has been overseeing based off of the PCIs that we've seen off of that uh, with those inspections, looking to add in some of these um, maintenance projects to extend the life of our pavement going forward based on that data. Similar proposition here in Antlers, uh, again at a 95.5 proposition based on PCI. Uh, looking to add a project at Ardmore Downtown Executive Airport. Uh, this is the first of several perimeter fences that uh, we are recommending to add it to adding to the ACP. Fences aren't something that we've traditionally done, uh, and a lot of our folks have been seeking some FAA funds for that. What we saw as those bids were coming to fruition is that some of the uh, newer pro uh, mandates in the federal funding is putting us into the 800 or 80 to 100 dollar per linear foot cost on a chain link fence that's this eight foot three barbed wire because it has to go through a design process, has to go through the public bidding, those types of things. What we're looking to do is probably work with some of our consultants around the state to get a basic kind of almost uh, unofficial state spec some, uh, to some degree that says, hey, this meets our, uh, this mitigates our main concern, which is typically wildlife for most of these places. And uh, this is going to see us through through the, you know, it's going to have a good life on it. We don't want to just go put out five strand barbed wire. We want to, this is probably going to be like an eight foot goat fence type of proposition. Uh, just trying to work with some of our uh, folks around the state that have done similar things uh, at some of our more rural airports to get some good ideas of the best route forward there. But really looking to drop, drop down that uh, linear foot cost because that's, uh, if that gave me heartburn, I, I can only imagine what Director Artie's felt whenever I first had that conversation with him. <laughs> so uh, looking at about a $500,000 total project cost, again, that cost is really going to be dictated by that process. We come up with that state spec and then try to kind of standardize that process through the, the public bidding process so we can alleviate some any variation there and get the best price that we can. Also at Armour Downtown, they are looking to construct a terminal building as part of our terminal project, uh, terminal building um, program in the 2026 20, time frame. They're going to be partnering some FAA funds with that, so the department share of that looking to be about $500,000 uh, currently, and we'll see how that shapes us up as they go through the design process. We have several that we're seeking to add, uh, projects that we're seeking to add to the ACP for Carlton Landing Field. Uh, now that they are in the, uh, they're in the FAA system, they are now fully classified. They have a more than 10 based aircraft. They are getting their entitlements and also will be able to compete with some discretionary funding on down the road as we 
uh, you'll see that we're going to pursue. But first and foremost, we want to conduct a terminal area planning study, uh, working with their recently selected uh, consultant to really, as we can see from this picture, we have some limited space to work with. We want to make sure that we maximize that space for really the revenue generating items that they have uh, or that they can take advantage of, i.e. hangers like they've already been building. Uh, get them in some additional apron space uh, because they'll need some parking and those types of things to go along with the an increased traffic that they've seen. And, uh, and so really that's just going to help give us a roadmap to go forward. Uh, as you'll see, the department share on that one is $100,000 for the planning study. And then <laughs> it's not a 95.5 because it's a state airport. So since we are the sponsor of that, obviously we will bear the cost aside from any FAA funds that are partnered. And so that is in the current fiscal year that we're se or, uh, seeking to add that to. And then uh, to follow that up, we would like to construct a taxi lane and apron using some partnering with some FAA funding here at a total cost anticipated about a $900,000 project cost. I think we just got one slide ahead, so sorry about that. Uh, but uh, our department share that looking to be about $150,000 partnering with about 750 dollars of FAA funding. Another one of those perimeter fence issues that we've uh, had across the state uh, exists at Carlton Landing as well. There are some interesting constraints down there. So primarily what we're trying to do more than anything, given that we have a very limited space on the east side, is to divert the deer that are traversing the runway very consistently, uh, trying to get those to go around the end if nothing else. Because as we can see from this picture, they're traversing from a wooded area over to the golf course uh, and vice versa throughout the day because they're looking for good food sources, those types of things. So really the intent is because it's so difficult to build a, a fence on that east side given the boundary, just trying to direct those around the runway rather than right through it. <laughs> then uh, following that up, we're looking to construct a new terminal building at this location as well at Carlton Landing. And that'll be based you know, according to the, the planning study that we go through and what we're looking uh, like in terms of some other partnerships out there, but uh, about a million dollar project costs a little more scaled down because obviously they don't need the same thing as a Durant does. And uh, also at uh, Carlton Landing, this is the FAA discretionary funding project that uh, I alluded to a little bit earlier. And the 2029 timeframe will be ready to rehabilitate their runway and look to improve airport drainage at that time as well at about a $2 million project cost with the department share being 10% of that. Excuse me. Moving on to Chandler Regional Airport. This is a project we're looking to add to the ACP in the 2028-29 timeframe. This is going to be a discretionary project to rehabilitate their runway based off the PCI. Obviously, that'll be driven uh, by the preliminary engineering report once we get to that point in terms of getting the whole scope. But that's our preliminary estimated cost at 2.5 million with our portion at half the local match. At Chattanooga Sky Harbor Airport, this is an existing airport, uh, or excuse me, existing project that we're seeking to update the scope to. Uh, we anticipate what we were intending to do initially was the bottom half of that interesting little uh, shape that you see on your screen. Uh, and what we've come to is we have some parties down there that are interested in some expanding out some business, uh, some ag spraying opportunities out there, uh, a couple of different entities as a matter of fact. And so we're trying to see if that would behoove us to include some of that additional apron into the scope and use that as ad alternates based off of how those uh, conversations move forward. So really what we're looking at here is just to show an added, con added cost here based off of those conversations and where the department share would be about $590,000. So bumping that, exp anticipating that if we expand that scope, we're going to probably about one to $200,000 more than what we were anticipating at the initial $400,000 level. And then also at Chattanooga, uh, following that up in the 2028-29 timeframe, looking to rehabilitate that runway based off of that PCI, uh, about $900,000 of apartment funds anticipated for that one. <coughs> Claremore Regional Airport, this is another one of those fence projects just to get them fully uh, enclosed in. Anticipate about half a million dollar project at a 95-5 split. Clarence E. Page Municipal Airport seeking to add a project to rehabilitate at Taxway Alpha to the tune of about $650,000 with the department share being half the local match anticipated about 35000 At Cleveland Municipal Airport, this is another crack seal and seal coat that we're seeking to add to the ACP at a 95-5 proposition. $300,000 anticipated. And that's based off of the recent uh, four pack that we did as well. So we had some pretty good numbers on those. 
At Kissing Municipal Airport, this is uh, just kind of our normal routine thing where we have a phase one going forward in the coming year, so we want to make sure on the back end we're planning for phase two. This is for the, sec the northern portion of the uh, parallel taxiway that we'll be anticipating for Cushing, uh, presuming that everything stays on track. Uh, still working to get everything uh, lined out for that first phase, but since we're working toward that goal, we want to make sure that we're planning for this one in the back end as well. Uh, so it didn't go, we always hate to go too far from phase one to phase two uh, if, we can, if we can help it. So, and we want to make sure that we're competing in the appropriate years for those discretionary funds as well. At El Reno Regional Airport, this is updating uh, the costs here to reflect the current market rates. So any changes in funding, this one's gone to about a $1.5 million project that we're anticipating uh, with uh, partnering with some FAA funds, but going above and beyond to get that full scope. And uh, our department share anticipated to be about 900,000 on that. At Elk City Regional Business Airport, this is a project to replace their 100 low lead fuel system. And I, th this one includes some piping and those types of things to get the dispenser uh, located at a different location, so that's why this is a, a million dollar project cost, whereas some of ours are closer to 600 and 700,000. Our portion of that would only be up to that $300,000 per system as we have in our rules for that program. At Enid Woodring Regional Airport, uh, we updated the cost at the overall cost at Enid for the taxi lane project. It's about a $1.4 million project. Uh, department chair uh, hasn't changed on that from the originally approved at half a million to this point, but wanted to show the added cost there. Also at Enid, uh, we'll be looking to slide back this rehabilitation of the runway by one year, simply because we're working with Vance to make sure that that's timed appropriately. At Guthrie Edmond Regional Airport, uh, we're looking to update the cost here on this uh, taxi lane construction uh, for the new in support of the new terminal building that'll be coming down the pike. Uh, a total of $1.9 million project anticipated, with the department share of that being about 900000 at Halliburton Field, we're seeking to add a project to rehabilitate runway 1735. This would be a discretionary project based upon the, uh, the need out there given their uh, thickness of pavement that they need for their operations. Anticipating that to be about a 900,000, or excuse me, <laughs> I wish it was 900,000, $9 million uh, discretionary project with the department share 5%, uh, four and a half, or four, $450,000. At Hefner Easley, this is a project to rehabilitate the runways so to update the costs based off of some of the issues that we've seen uh, with the taxiway project as well as other projects on the east side of Oklahoma. So really anticipate that to go up just at once we start to dig into what's actually underneath there. So I want to make sure that based off of those other issues we've seen uh, in the eastern side of the state that we're planning accordingly. At Hinton Municipal Airport, they're looking to be added to our hangar program in the 2025-26 time frame. 40% uh, match, uh, or 40% share of the, for the department at a $900,000 uh, total project cost. At Hollis Municipal, another crack seal seal coat at 95.5 um, for some of our smaller airports to keep up with our pavement maintenance. At Medilla Municipal, this is uh, their project to, for their new runway, still working to get over the justification hurdle. Uh, so they're just seeking to slide that back while they still work through that issue. At McAllister Regional Airport, this is a new project we're seeking to add to the ACP uh, to rehabilitate parallel taxiway and the runway and taxiway lighting. So this is where we'd partner with some uh, FAA funds on uh, part of this and then you'll seek to get the rest of it done while everything's closed. Uh, just one closure to avoid some additional there, just shy of $1.7 million anticipated there with a department share anticipated to be 600000 And also at McAllister Airport, uh, we're looking to uh, acquire some land. There are some areas there as they are constrained, looking to just acquire all the available land that they can to realize all available aer aeronautical space and use that they, they are able. Obviously, as we move forward with any of those, those will be based off of assessed values uh, and subject to change, but wanted to go ahead and get that represented on the new ACP as we move forward. Miami Regional Airport, another uh, perimeter fence project they're seeking in the 2028 timeframe at a 95.5 proposition. At Okmulgee Regional Airport, this is a project we're seeking to add to construct and re reconfigure their terminal apron. It'll be following along to their terminal building project as well. We'll be seeking to compete for FAA funds for that, a $2.5 million project, the departments at half the local match. Obviously, uh, the diagram will be subject to change as we move forward with their planning study as well. I am, uh, <laughs> I I'm not the graphics guy. I just try to show uh, the meat and potatoes type of thing. At Paul's Valley Municipal Airport, we are seeking to construct a parallel taxiway to the modern design standards that North Connector has been an issue 
uh, with FAA standards for a while. We'll be looking to construct that and remove any of the problematic connectors as well, just based off of the, uh, the budget that we have to work with at that time. Total project cost 2.5 million, uh, department share of 5%. Prairie Municipal Airport, this is another re runway uh, rehabilitation that uh, we're anticipating based off of PCI values. Uh, total project cost here will be dictated by the preliminary engineering report we do here in a couple years, but anticipating a $4 million project cost, department share being 5%. Ponca City Regional Airport, this is an existing project we anticipate will slide back to the 2027 timeframe. Uh, no other changes here. We just anticipate that in order for them to really compete for discretionary funding and the additional funds that we believe that they may need, just based off of other thicknesses we've seen at similar airports, i.e. Duncan, uh, we anticipate that that current engineer's estimate is uh, low based off the bids that we've seen, but of course we hope we're wrong. At Prairie Municipal Airport, this is another uh, simple crack seal and seal coat we're looking to do to maintain our airport across the system. At Robert S. Kerr Airport in Poto, uh, we are seeking to add a project into the ACP. This one's a little, uh, a bit of a misnomer. We have a current uh, project in the ACP currently for rehabilitate and extend. We couldn't get the extension part over the justification hurdle in time with FAA, uh, given how fast we were wanting to move forward with a rehabilitation based off of the, the PCI values out there in the current conditions. So we're seeking to move forward with the runway rehabilitation in this fiscal year with a discretionary project department, uh, department share being half the, or half the local match at $125,000. And as we move to the next slide, this would be the other portion of that, uh, breaking apart the extension of the runway and moving that to the 26, 27 timeframe, uh, whenever we can, again, keep, compete for some good discretionary funds. And I know that their consultant has also recent, recently finished a white paper that helps with that justification aspect as well. We just wanted to make sure that we didn't get behind the eight ball with our pavement main, main, maintenance while we also worked to get the additional pavement and get them to a full 5,000 feet out there. And so the extension portion that I anticipated is about $4 million project uh, cost, and that'll be dependent on how it competes for the funding. At Salisaw Municipal Airport, we are seeking to construct a 10 bay T hangar. And so this is one of them where I think, uh, as we reviewed, we, we got cross-eyed on our, our numbers here a little bit. Uh, and so obviously our, our share for hangar projects can only be up to 40%. And so uh, at a $2 million project cost, the department share here would be 800,000, not a million. We can't go up to 50%. Uh, sorry, George, I wish I could break the rules for you, but Michelle would have my hide if I did that. So as we'll hear about the rules here in just a little bit as well. So uh, just looking at a standard uh, hangar project for them, to open up that southern area and get some, uh, they have some other areas that they'd like to try to get some, for some land leases and those types of things, but they really need to get a handle on their current tenants and get them figured out before they can really start to look at the, those other opportunities in front of them. And then at uh, Scott Field in Mangum, this is a rehabilitation project based off PCI uh, coming in the 2027 timeframe. We're seeking to add a uh, 95.5 total uh, project cost of 950,000. At Seminole Municipal Airport, they're seeking to enter our terminal program in the 2028 timeframe, anticipating a $2 million project uh, with their share being half of that with our match. Our match obviously only going up to a million regardless of what they wind up with on their total project cost. At sh I guess we got out of, okay. Mine's different, I messed it up. So with uh, Shawnee Regional Airport, we have an assortment of projects we're seeking to add to the ACP to help get them whole following the storms that they recently have had to deal with and are still working through. The first of which would be to add their terminal building uh, into the ACP at an anticipated $2.5 million project cost with the department share being the standard uh, half, uh, half of the match up to a million dollars. The second project we're recommending at Shawnee Regional will be to construct a taxi lane for hangar development to that south, southern portion there, the southeast of the, uh, the main apron area there to the tune of uh, $500,000. That'd be a 95-5 proposition. And then add them to our T hangar project, uh, our hangar program with T hangers. And uh, after we get that uh, taxi lane done, follow up to get them some T hangers replaced so that they can, they can really uh, re replace some of that storage space that they lost uh, from that storm that moved through. So anticipating that that T-hanger project be about a $2 million project with the department share being 800,000. This is similar to how the uh, Salisaw hanger should have looked here. 
And then moving on to Stan Stamper, uh, we'd be looking to uh, add a project in the 2027 timeframe uh, to develop the north portion of their parallel taxiway to continue on with uh, what they've been able to do there going south. $800,000 proposition working with some FAA funds, uh, our portion of that being about $40,000. At Stigler Regional Airport, we are looking to improve the runway safety area grading drainage system, adding this in the 2027 timeframe. Partnering with FAA funds, to, uh, total project cost 605,000. Department share anticipated about 125,000 on that one. At Tahlequah Municipal Airport, we are seeking to construct a taxi lane, and what we're trying to do is move this one up and then split this out from what we had it in before. Previously, it's in the existing ACP as a construct taxi lane and construct uh, the hangar building. Uh, instead, what we're looking to do is to still construct the hangar taxi lane because what we're trying to aim to do is to get some of those folks on the west side to, to relocate and build on, their, on the east side, get out of the transitional surface out there. And then also uh, what we've heard as we've been working with the airport, originally we thought the box hangar was going to be the better idea. But for ex existing tenants and many of those that have hangars on the west side, they would rather rent just a T hangar space from them than, re than relocate and build a similar size to what they have on the west side. So following their demand, we are recommending that we split this out, the tax lane being a pr about $900,000 proposition and a T hangar facility uh, smaller than the ones that we've been looking at for uh, the other two airports, but about a million dollar project with FAA funds added to that with the, our, our share being 40%. At Thomas Municipal Airport, this is a project we're seeking to add in the ACP in the 28-29 timeframe to rehabilitate their runway based off PCI at a $2 million project cost with the commission, or excuse me, the department share being 5% uh, of that match. At Veneta, we are seeking to add a few different projects given the, uh, the growth and the things that they've seen out there, the activity that they have had. And so based off of their CIP, we're seeking to help them to construct a new airport entrance road and parking area. So this is to help actually develop them some apron area because as we can see there, there really doesn't exist much. I think that maybe we've seen three <laughs> airplanes that have been parked out there that could actually maneuver and still get to the fuel. Uh, so they're getting pretty, uh, pretty stacked in there, and we're trying to open up that southern area and take advantage of the, the property that they do have. So this would be about a $950,000 project at a 95.5. Second project at uh, Veneta would be to partner with some FAA funding and add uh, construction of a new apron and connector taxiway. Uh, this would be approximately a $1.3, $1 $1.4 million project, department share being half the local match. And the last one we're recommending to add it for Veneta would be to construct a new terminal building as part of our terminal program. Uh, again, this would be a scaled down version, about a million dollar project cost. We'll be looking to partner with them on in Veneta in the 2027 timeframe. At Watonga Municipal Airport, we are seeking to add to the ACP uh, the term, new terminal building uh, for the terminal program in the 2029 time frame. Anticipated $2 million project cost, but uh, our portion be at 50%. And this, uh, we'll be looking to up, this is in a partnership with the existing project that we have for Watonga here uh, to construct the taxi lane and apron on the west side of the airport. Uh, they have uh, bumped up their FAA costs and we have, are recommending that we uh, update our costs as well to try to meet that full scope and get that taxi lane and apron filled, finished out in one project. That way you can move right along to, uh, to the t terminal building from there. So our portion be going to, uh, from 500,000 to 900,000, and they've increased their FAA funds as well to bring that to a $1.7 million total project cost. As we go on and nearing the end, we're getting to Weatherford Stafford Airport, and this is where we're looking to uh, up, simply update the cost to an existing uh, project to uh, $900,000 department share, and again, that's just based off of what we've seen on recent bids as we've done similar projects across the state. At Wilburton Municipal Airport, we're seeking to add a basic crack seal seal coat at the 95.5 proposition. And at Wiley Post, seeking to add a project to, um, or to rehabilitate taxiway Bravo. It's be anticipated to be a $2.5 million project cost where our portion would be half the local match. And to finish this up today, at William R. Pogue Municipal Airport in Sand Springs, they are seeking to add a 100 by 90 box hanger to the hangar program in the 2026 timeframe. Total project cost anticipated to be a $1.3 million. Uh, on their uh, CIP, really all they requested was the 400,000. And so uh, we could obviously approve up to uh, the 40% if we would like, but uh, going based off of what they had in their request, uh, $400,000 what I have here. 
that is what I recommend for us to include in the upcoming ACP, and I do recommend that we go to public comment on that document, but I would stand for any questions that anybody has. Sounds good. This item is requesting to move into a public comment phase and not for final approval of this next ACP. Are there any questions? I, uh, I saw in some places where your 40% amount was actually 50%, so I think you've got a slide or two to correct. Right, yeah, I, I noticed one of those. I, I tried to mention on the ones that I caught, but yes, okay. uh, uh, some of those it was just based off of what they had on their CIP and we just didn't catch during our QC. Okay. I'll call that because it's in my sleepless dad era, so. <laughs> Congratulations. Um, are you looking for a motion? Look for a motion. I move that we uh, move this uh, five-year construction program into the uh, public comment phase. Okay, we have a motion. Do I have a second? Second. Okay, call the roll. Commissioner Phillips. Yes. Vice Chair Rainey. Yes. Commissioner Putnam. Aye. Commissioner Hunter. Aye. Thank you. Okay, the motion passes. Uh, now we're going back to item 10, airport construction program consent docket. Uh, any commissioner may request that any or all items of a consent docket be considered individually, Ben. Yes, good morning. Good morning, Mr. Commissioner. Uh, the first project that we have is at Alwa. Uh, the project consists of constructing a new jet A fuel system. Uh, based on the bid, the total project cost is about $653,000, and that will be funded with $300,000 of a state grant fund and about uh, $353,000 of a sponsor matching fund. Uh, we have Mr. Steve Ford, city business manager here. Come over here. Good morning, gentlemen. We uh, just want to come here this morning and uh, tell you we really appreciate you considering this. Uh, this new fuel system really enhance our uh, operations at the airport, uh, especially since we just got a new life flight service in Alba, based out of Alba. Uh, they'll be able to fuel themselves 24 hours a day uh, when they come back from runs, so that'll really be an uh, enhancement to their service in our community. Yeah, good. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, it's a one-hour flight to Alba, but it's a three-hour car ride. Yeah. <laughs> okay, next project's at Barsville. And the project uh, consists of constructing a taxi lane. Based on the bid, the total project cost is over $2 million, and that will be funded with $737,000 of a federal grant fund, over $1.1 million of a state grant fund, and over $100,000 of a sponsor matching fund. We have Mr. Mike Richardson, airport manager. Uh, good morning, Commissioners. My name is Mike Richardson. I'm the Airport Director for the City of Bartlesville. Um, on behalf of the City Manager, Mike Bailey, Chris Batchelder, who's with us here today uh, from the Bartlesville Development Authority. Um, we appreciate the opportunity to be here this morning. Um, as you may or may not know, uh, Bartlesville is the birthplace of Phillips 66 and the aviation fuels. and uh, products and services and Bartlesville and aviation have always been closely tied um, I'm here this morning to thank you for consideration of this important project in our community it will play a large role in re-envisioning uh, our airport as an MRO hub potentially um, again thank you for consideration of this uh, project and all you do for our state and local communities Thank you. You bet. Okay, next project is at David J. Perry. Uh, the project is a change order actually uh, for the reconstructing the taxi lane and the change order will allow for subgrade stabilization due to unsuitable subgrade. Uh, the estimated additional cost is about $185,000 and that will be funded with one, over $175,000 of a state grant fund and over $9,000 of a sponsor matching fund. Next project at Durant, uh, the project consists of constructing a new access road and a hangar facility for the south hangar development area. The estimated design cost 
of the project is about $200,000. That will be funded with about $80,000 of a state grant fund and about $120,000 of a sponsor matching fund. Next project at Robert Esquire. Uh, the project consists of rehabilitating the runway pavement. Uh, the estimated design cost uh, of the project is um, over $189,000. That will be funded with $170,000 of a FEDAR grant fund, uh, $9,500 of a state grant fund, and over $9,000 uh, of a sponsor matching fund. And the last project is at South Grand Lake. Uh, the project consists of uh, acquiring land based on the negotiated land appraisal. The, pro the total project cost is over $205,000, and that will be funded with over $195,000 of a sponsor of a state grant fund and over $10,000 of a sponsor matching fund. I'm standing for any question, but the staff recommends approval. Okay, any questions on about item 10? Uh, under C and David J. Perry, I know they got hit by a tornado and their hangars got torn up. Is there anything in the, in the this is in addition to what you just talked about. Right. Is there anything in the works to, to help them with that? Hello? All right. Uh, Commissioner, this uh, project, the change order for this project is to replace those damaged T-hangers. Um, and so what happened was the, the contractor got on site, uh, they started opening up the soil, and uh, they found some very, very unsuitable subgrade, and they could not get compaction based on um, some of the veins of unsuitable soil that were out there. Uh, we thought that it was going to be able to be alleviated just by mechanical means but uh, chemical stabilization was going to be necessary, and that's what this cost is for, is wow. to chem chemically uh, stabilize that subgrade so that we can uh, go get the uh, proper pavement put down there, and we're not gonna be back there in five or 10 years doing major rehab. Okay, thank you. No further questions. Okay, do we have a motion to approve this consent docket or to approve specific items? I move for uh, approval of all of them. All right. Do we have a second? I second the motion. Any discussion? Call the roll, please. Commissioner Phillips. Aye. Vice Chair Rainey. Aye. Commissioner Putnam. Aye. Commissioner Hunter. Aye. Thank you, Ben. Moving on to item 11, prep fund project consent docket. As with the previous items, any commissioner may request that any or all items on a consent docket be considered individually. Director Artis, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, today before you, we have uh, three uh, prep projects. Uh, this is the, the culmination of the discussions that we've had over the last many months and, and years now that the, the prep funding has been approved. Um, obviously, you hear about uh, my updates uh, in, a, in a future item about other projects, but the three before you today. Uh, the first one uh, is a, a new project for commercial air service development at the Tulsa National Airport. Uh, as you will recall, we were awarded $4 million, or we were uh, provided $4 million uh, for our commercial air service development program. This is about attracting new nonstop routes uh, to the state of Oklahoma. Um, obviously, that's important for business activity and economic development, but also important for tourism uh, and just general transportation of people, goods, and services. Uh, today, we have uh, a project for Tulsa, uh, nonstop air service between one of the following destinations, that being San Francisco, Seattle, San Diego, Boston, or Cancun. Uh, Tulsa's grant am request amount uh, that you are considering today is $2 million. Uh, and they're committing $500,000 in matching funds uh, as required by law. It's a 20% match requirement. Um, the uh, approval is obviously contingent upon the department receiving an acceptable final grant application uh, based on the specific route that will eventually have been negotiated between airline. We're asking for flexibility here to pick one of these routes, um, but until the governing board approves a level of funding, the, the airport can't go and commit to those airlines saying we have X for this route, and so we're giving them that flexibility. And then once they've uh, found an airline uh, in, a, in a destination that is committed uh, to Tulsa, then we'll go about executing it on, on the staff side. So that being said, I think we have some folks from Tulsa here that uh, would be happy to say a few words if you uh, wouldn't mind coming forward. Go 
Good morning. Uh, my name is Andrew Perini. I'm with Alawana Pacific Aviation Consulting, and I'm with, here with Stephanie Chester, the Director of Marketing and Community Relations for Tulsa National Airport. Um, as Grayson mentioned, we are uh, applying for $2 million in state funding uh, to be used towards one of these routes. Um, the competitive landscape for air service development has continued to increase, uh, even more recently with uh, pilot, pilot shortages, aircraft shortages, more recently uh, due to uh, engine, or engine manufacturer issues on the new Airbus aircraft as well as some delivery delays from other uh, manufacturers as well like Boeing. Um, so there's less resources for, uh, or for the airlines to be able to utilize on new routes. Um, so this funding gives uh, Tulsa another lever, lever to be able to pitch to these airlines uh, uh, and hopefully move up the priority list uh, towards uh, securing service on some of, these, some of these new routes. So we were very excited when the state appropriated these funds um, and we're happy to answer any questions you may have about our application. What do these funds actually pay for? So the way the revenue guarantees work, um, essentially the fund, uh, you enter into an agreement with the airline and the airline sets a certain revenue target per flight, say it's $13,000 $13, per flight. Uh, on a, every specific flight basis, any sort of revenue shortfall, the airline will calculate and then true up at the end of the month or a quarter based on what you agree upon in the, in the contract. Um, so any sort of revenue shortfall will then be drawn out of these funds. Uh, the hope uh, and what we anticipate is that all of these markets uh, do well pretty much right out of the gate and that these funds are more of sort of the icing on the cake for the airlines as a, a way to de-risk the, the um, introduction of new service. Uh, so over time, hopefully just at the beginning of service is when you start seeing some of these funds being used and over time as the market matures, uh, less and less funds are needed. Uh, then uh, at the end of the, the term, any sort of remaining funds would then go back to the state to be able to use towards uh, other air service initiatives for all the state's airports. All right, let's suppose they lose on eight flights over the course of a month, and then the next month everything's running profitably. Do they replace those funds? No, so uh, you draw it on uh, a month uh, per flight, but on the per flight basis, so you would just draw every every month. So say you know the first month of service, you drew twenty thousand dollars from the funds. Uh, if month two there was a surplus in revenue, uh, you just would not draw from the funds, and just the remaining balance would be less for left for the remainder of the term. So basically, this is a grant. Uh, it's a grant, a but they don't get grants. they don't get full access to the funds. They just draw from them. Um, the only time, in theory, if the route did poorly, you could use up all the funds over the, the period of however long, the one to two years that you agree with. But um, typically what you see is that the, the amount that is drawn uh, starts to go downhill as the market continues to mature. Okay. Any additional questions on, on A before we move on to B for me? What airline is it? So that, that's, we don't uh, have an airline. That's the, the flexibility we are asking for is they have a desire to go for one of those routes. Obviously, some of those routes we kind of know the airlines. I mean, San Francisco, probably going to be United. Uh, Seattle, probably, who, who would Seattle be? That's United. Alaska or Delta, Alaska. yeah. I, I knew Alaska, but I knew there was one other. Uh, San Diego, you know, uh, multitude of airlines. Boston, probably Delta. Um, so that's the, the flexibility is to go offer these destinations mm -hmm. so they can go uh, compete for uh, this service for various. I mean, obviously, if you're going to, uh, if you're going to a, a city that that airline's not serving, you're not going to go to that airline and say, hey, would you like, would you like to start service? It's just going to be based on the logic of, the airlines that are flying into that route. Um, one of the things that, that we didn't talk about is these routes uh, have passengers per day each way that people are already going. So this isn't like a pie in the sky. Uh, as you heard Andrew mention, this is more uh, icing on the cake to try and show as you know Tulsa competes with maybe five or 10 or 15 other communities across the country that may not be offering this, that Tulsa ends up being at the, at the selection uh, end of, of a route. Uh, one of the things we've seen is there may be 
five profitable routes out there, um, but the airline only has aircraft to go pick one, and they may only have crew to go pick one. And so if we can incentivize and, and get a, we'll call it the minimum revenue guarantee, uh, that's going to hopefully bring Oklahoma's airports to the, the top of the list in having that new nonstop selection. So, How many other routes have we had to do this on? So this is a new concept for us, Commissioner. This is a responsibility the legislature provided to our agency in the uh, 2022 legislative session uh, based on several interim studies that said that Oklahoma, excuse me, could utilize this as a leveraging tool for moving forward to bring new nonstop air service to the state of Oklahoma. Um, I know, for example, Stillwater, when they started up their commercial air service, uh, they had to do their own minimum revenue guarantee uh, through the city and the university to, to start that service. Um, had this program been in place back when that started in 2016, I would expect that they would have taken advantage of something like this. Um, they are still in an MRG world. Um, I think if not for COVID, they, that route would be standing on its own two legs right now. Um, so Do most communities offer minimum revenue guarantees when an airline decides to open up? I, that I don't know. Um, I know a lot of the new startup non server, non new nonstop service they, they have in, in certain situations. Yes. When the city really wants that new route, they're going after and, and adding that MRG as a tool in their toolkit to stand out from the rest of the community of communities that are trying to compete for new service. Is the city of Tulsa contributing to this fund? So the city of Tulsa as a community is committed $500,000 in matching funds. Um, that is coming from the Tulsa Community Foundation. One of the specific instances, FAA does not allow the airport to contribute to MRGs. It has to be other sources within the community. So city of Tulsa, foundations, economic development organizations, chambers of commerce, uh, they can provide the monies, but our program can't go directly to the airport for MRGs based on uh, FAA rules and regulations. And that's, that's why we were burdened with this, was we knew that uh, expectation within state government, the best out of any state agency, for moving these kinds of projects forward. But yeah, they, they've committed, as a community, they've committed to at least $500,000 um, to this particular project. You're asking us to vote on this today? Mm-hmm. And this is, the, this is the first time, right? I this would this like is the first time. to do some more research on this before I give it a yay or nay to find out how often this sort of thing is actually done and what success rate. Um, we, we can certainly bring this back at the, the May meeting. Um, just understand, Commissioner, that this was an obligation put to us by the legislature to allocate these prep monies uh, to these various communities. Um, and like I said, we've, we've done our due diligence on, on the staff side. Um, if you want to have a copy of their grant application, happy to provide you with a copy of their application. So the state legislature has already approved this $2 million for this project. Uh, four million, I heard. Well, so they've approved $4 million of commercial air service funding for us to delegate to the okay, purposes. So it's, it's not ours to decide whether it's an effective use of taxpayer dollars or not. It's just a matter of who gets them. Yes, yeah. Well, the, the decision of whether or not we believe in the program or not has already been decided. Right. We as a body are deciding where is the best spot to put these funds uh, across the state of Oklahoma. So okay. do you see this as a, as a project program that's going to be used many more times coming up in the future? Is this kind of a one-time deal or? I would say, Commissioner, that depends on the success of the program. Um, you know, if we're able to contribute this $2 million to Tulsa and then let's say another community, well, Rogers comes with a $2 million uh, request for nonstop service from Oklahoma City. Um, and we can prove that those new routes were profitable and brought in X number of visitors to the state, X number of you know business business flying flights to the state. I could see the legislature having an interest in continuing this. Uh, but at the end of the day, 
whether they continued or not, I think is going to be dictated based on how this first four million, uh, how this first four million tranche of money goes. Um, there's one thing I will say is that this, the new routes are not. There's a finite number of routes that we can have in the state of Oklahoma with four million people. Um, we're not going to go get a route from Oklahoma City to Paris or Oklahoma City to London. There's just not physically enough people in the state that are going to those destinations. So you can't, you can't subsidize airline service when it's not already potentially going to be profitable. What we're doing is we're reducing the risk of that startup service at the very initial onset of that, of that location. Um, you know, the passengers per day each way on these communities here uh, it makes sense to be able to, to do that. Um, but at some point in time, let's, let's just you know, say 10 years from now, we've done this for eight different routes, and now our passengers per day at the next logical route for us to get, maybe let's say that passenger per day each way, maybe 30 people, you're not gonna find an airplane out there that's gonna house those 30 people profitably and go to that route. So at some point, there is a finite number of routes just based on people and seats in Oklahoma we become a you know six million person state in five or ten years, that may be a different story. I don't think we're on that growth trajectory right now, though, as a state. So there there is a finite number of routes that I see um, that I see us being able to get. But for right now, there's probably for Oklahoma City and Tulsa, there's probably another there's probably five to seven or eight locations that have the passengers per day each way that would potentially make a profitable route um, and would be able to convince an airline to start that route. The state legislature has has created this, seen yep. fit to create it, correct. and the governor has signed off on it. Is correct. that correct? Senate Bill 1461, Commissioner Hunter, was passed during the 2022 session. It was brought to the commission in December of 2021 as item number 12, and it passed 7 to 0. So the commission has vetted this, and the governor did sign it. Okay, fair enough. Uh, Moving on to item B, if we may so do so. Um, uh, West Woodward Airport, uh, we've got a project here for a 110 by 70 hangar. Uh, that is uh, part of their prep program uh, request. Uh, total project cost based on their uh, negotiated uh, rates is about $316,000. Um, you know, this is a 100% project because these are uh, directed prep monies to that community, and the community does have desire to utilize their prep monies on this particular hangar. Item C. Um, if you'll recall, one of the uh, directed uh, projects for the $100 million in prep money we received, uh, one of the four major, we'll call them quote unquote mega projects, uh, constructing a new MRO hangar at the Will Rogers World Airport. Uh, is about uh, just shy of, uh, or just over $37 million. Uh, we're committing $19.6 million of that to the uh, project, whereas the sponsor, through a, a lease credit uh, with the uh, tenant, is contributing about 17, almost $17.5 million of uh, total project costs. This is to bring in a three bay, 737, A320 uh, style hangar. Um, uh, AAR has uh, identified or actually entered into a lease agreement with Alaska Airlines to do their 737 max maintenance uh, as that max comes in for heavy C and D checks. And so that is what this is going to bring about, about another 200 to 225 additional jobs to that, to that community based on these new three lines of maintenance that are gonna be put in this hangar. Uh, but I'll uh, stop talking there. I believe we've got uh, some folks from the Oklahoma City Will Rogers World Airport. If you wouldn't mind joining me up front. Good morning, uh, Commissioners. Jeff Mulder, the Director of Airports here in Oklahoma City. Grayson kind of laid out the details of all of that. Um, we, um, we are going to be building the, the hangar for um, AAR, but as he mentioned, it's a combination of state and AAR funding for the project. So we're to the point now that we've got the design complete and we're ready to go out for bids, and so we appreciate your support for moving this forward. And we are, uh, we're hoping to have a uh, groundbreaking on this sometime in the month of April, as you heard Sandra mention in her events item. Uh, but uh, staff recommends uh, approval for A, B, and C. 
uh, here. If you have any questions, any, any further questions, I will happy to answer them, or we can have the uh, the members uh, that are here answer those questions. Any additional questions? You're gonna hurt me, but I'm gonna bring back item A real quick. Does does Andrew or do yourself do you have any simulations or timelines how long you think that monies might last if this were to go Let, into effect? Uh, bring Andrew back for that question. What was the question? Just like in, any timeline or simulations that you guys have done to, to you know to, to simulate how much that money might last whenever if, if it were to go into place you know if, if they start drawing from it I mean is this like a two month deal a two year deal do you, do you know so uh, it depends on the agreement that you make with the airline typically yeah. uh, most of the time the one to two year agreements okay. um, you, you do see some some uh, agreements on some international flights that'll be a little bit longer and a, a higher dollar number okay um, you know uh, and they can be like the state of the state of Indiana, I believe, put uh, five to seven million dollars towards uh, a flight to Paris a couple times a week. Okay. Um, so it just depends on the agreement with the airline. Who um, negotiates that agreement with the airline? Uh, so as Grayson mentioned, the FAA does not allow any sort of airport revenues or negotiation of these types of agreements directly with the airlines. Um, so it could be anyone from a consultant, consulting firm that the airline or the airport uses. Uh, it could be uh, the economic development agencies in the city. It could be the city itself, the county. Basically anyone uh, but the airport themselves is the one that is uh, directly negotiating. The, airline, the airport is allowed to be in the conversations with, but it's just but it I can't would, be. I would expect somebody from the state would be negotiating that deal since it's state funds to make sure that we've got a route that benefits that community and and our state one with a significant likelihood of success and not negotiating a term that oh yeah we'll give you 18,000 a flight instead of 13 or, or whatever yeah so I, I don't know who comes up with that number who negotiates that on behalf of us yeah that's a good question and do you have thoughts on that yeah, so I mean, we, we certainly will be a part of the process, uh, Commissioner. At the end of the day, though, we are the granting organization to the community and entrusting the community. <clears throat> on behalf of us being the taxpayer. On behalf of the state of Oklahoma and the legislature having provided these monies for this particular program. Um, I'm certainly happy to be a part of those conversations and certainly willing to uh, negotiate as, as best as possible. Uh, at the end of the day, we also want to make sure that we are actually getting that airline service and incentivizing that new airline service, too. Um, as Andrew mentioned. My question is more, do we have somebody who's qualified to do those negotiations? Or are we just throwing some government bureaucrat at it? And no, the, the people that are going to be in these negotiations are, are well qualified, whether it's from the consultant, the community, or us. We, we definitely are not just simply being led uh, like lands to you know what uh, on behalf of the airlines. We're, we're there with the experts. Andrew mentioned each community has uh, a commercial air service consultant on board uh, or someone on staff that is an expert negotiating with the airlines. And obviously while you're not, you're not able to directly negotiate, we're all there to help make sure that it's an equal bargaining table. And, and just to add, um, as Grayson mentioned, both uh, most communities do have, or airports do have an air service development consultant on, her, on hand. So when these negotiations are taking place, those firms are able to run their own uh, airline route forecast to see what potentially would be a, a logical number that um, both the state and the airports and everyone involved is comfortable with. So it's not just a, we have $2 million. You know, we would potentially have that $2 million in our, in our bucket, but if, you know, the consulting firm comes back and says, hey, I think a million to 1.5 million is probably what we want to go with that um, those forecasts are able to be run so the state has that comfortability that it's not uh, just throwing money out you know at a specific route that it doesn't need to the reason I ask is because well at the federal level they don't have the best uh, <laughs> their idea of a successful negotiation <laughs> is any number uh, we got it signed it's a deal it's a good deal not every deal is a good deal. They're a good deal if we benefit more than it costs. Yep. At the state level, I think Governor Stitt should at least 
have the right people in place, or I yeah. should hope No, so. that makes sense. And, you know, at, we kind of talked about it at the beginning, too. Um, or besides just having the consulting firms being able to um, negotiate these uh, on behalf of the airports, um, you know, the state has, gone, has uh, had a commercial air service study done uh, on behalf of this program as well. Um, so there's a lot of, you know, checks and balances to make sure that the right amount of money is being given. But also, um, the way that these programs are structured, it's not just a cash grant. Um, it is a, is a fund that is being drawn from, and like I talked about earlier, the hope is being that maybe it draws from it for the first couple of months, and then it uh, meets that profitability goal going forward. Um, so a lot of that, that money potentially is going to be coming back to the state. Um, and for these airlines, I, sh I should mention, uh, Previously, I worked for uh, on the airline planning side as well, and the airlines don't just go into markets to that have money. Just because there's money available does not mean right. that it, they're going to go into it. There are several communities that have funds available that have had these funds sitting for a while. We've applied for routes that we've had successful conversations with with the airlines already, um, and they've told us that you know any sort of incentive behind it would kind of push you over the edge here. So. Uh, we're hoping that this is kind of that, that final push to uh, securing some of these services that are uh, at the top of our unserved market list. Okay. Thank you. Any, any additional questions? The Will Rogers um, uh, hangar. That's an awful lot of money coming from us. Where's it coming from? So that was part, part, part of the PrEP program, uh, the $100 million that the legislature dedicated to us uh, for basically $80 million of that was earmarked to four locations. Uh, one was Woodward, one was Ardmore for their air cargo facility, and that was a little higher, I think that was $22.35 million. Uh, Woodward got 20, uh, Tulsa International for their air traffic control tower got 20, and then Will Rogers World Airport got 20, and that's that's where this 19.6 is coming from. Is those I don't like using the word earmark, but that's really what we have here is a state level earmark that was provided to those four entities um, the to legislature's just running to construct uh, those cool. items. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I, I would call it a pass through, but it's not quite a pass through. Yeah, I understand. It's not coming from our normal. No, this is buckets. not coming from normal yeah. competitive monies. This is coming from those specific prep program monies that were dedicated to those projects. I'll sleep better now. Thank you. Absolutely. For a motion. Yeah. Motion to approve. Second. Second. Uh, if there's not any more further discussion, call the roll, please. Commissioner Phillips. Yes. Vice Chair Rainey. Aye. Commissioner Putnam. Aye. Commissioner Hunter. Aye. Motion passes. Are we ready for uh, item 12, the prep fund update? Item 12 uh, for our prep fund update. So obviously we covered a few of the projects uh, right there, but we'll uh, cover the ones that we did not cover already, and that would be the Tulsa Air Traffic Control Tower. Uh, I think they're hoping to bid out here in the next couple of months. So we may see that one come up for approval at the May meeting, uh, probably July meeting at the latest. Um, I know, uh, as I mentioned in uh, the previous item, we're looking at Will Rogers World Airport, uh, maybe putting forth a commercial air service uh, development application here that might come at the May meeting, might come at the July meeting. Uh, but I would expect that they, with some of their interest in new direct routes, uh, will be forthcoming on, on that particular item. Ardmore is still uh, in the design process for Phase two, and that is utilities uh, and site improvements to support the air cargo initiative. Phase one is, is well underway, and that's the parallel piece of the parallel taxiway there for the primary runway. Um, Woodward, uh, as we just approved a minute ago, uh, for the small hangar, uh, they have uh, their first phase uh, of the large improvements, which would be their terminal building, uh, their large MRO hangar, uh, and opening up the new development area. Uh, hopefully on schedule for bidding out sometime this summer. Uh, and then, of course, the, the follow-on projects, the runway extension, uh, and a few of the other activities for later uh, in this calendar year, maybe by the end of the year, hopefully have bids in hand for that. But uh, prep, prep is certainly uh, ongoing and very exciting, uh, but I'll stand for any questions. Questions, comments? 
Okay, with no comments, next up is item 14, Aerospace Education Classroom Grant Program Consent Docket. As with the earlier items, any commissioner may request that any or all items on a consent docket be considered individually. Uh, Director Artis, continue. So uh, this is the Aerospace Education Classroom Grant Pilot Program, uh, pilot being generic, not specific, as in this is kind of a test program. Um, as you all will recall, you approved us uh, in our um, world-beating world aero education budget uh, back at the July meeting last year that we were to commit a million dollars to aero education across the state of Oklahoma. Um, part of that was for the competitive grants that you awarded in August. Part of that was to help us put on some of these events throughout the state of Oklahoma, like the UAS teacher training that you just uh, saw Paula talk about like the AOPA training that's upcoming, like our student flight days that we uh, did so well at uh, across the state of Oklahoma. Um, one of the things that you all approved money for was $125,000 for this classroom grant, uh, laboratory grant improvement program. Uh, we received, I believe it was, was it 13, Michelle? 13, 14. We received 14 applications for over $500,000 for classroom laboratory improvements. Um, of course, these are all from the four-year AOPA schools and the two-year uh, Choose Aerospace schools and some of the other ed educational institutions out there that are doing aerospace and aviation programs. Uh, knowing that having a good classroom lab uh, is an important piece to getting these kids educated and interested in the program, uh, very uh, foundational. Um, so it was a tough, tough allotment there to pick uh, these six. Of course, we could have just picked uh, three uh, and done, uh, you know, two at the max of fifty thousand uh, dollars, and then one at the the minimum of twenty five or minimum uh, smaller amount twenty five. But we want to try and spread the money around as, as fast as we could. Uh, minimum minimum award in our pilot program was twenty thousand um, dollars, and so we were trying to spread this as far and wide as we can. Um, obviously, making a geographic diversity. Uh, making sure we have a, a size, school size diversity, uh, and trying to spread this across state of Oklahoma. So what you see before you are the six programs uh, and their amounts, and I believe, unless staff corrects me, we have representatives from each program that uh, may want to come up and say something. So uh, Ada for twenty thousand dollars. We'll start with Ada. We got a representative from Ada, Chris. Good morning and thank you, uh, Grayson and commissioners, for having us here today. Um, I'm sure you guys are all well aware our program has been doing the AOPA curriculum for seven years as well as our elementary aspects. Um, just here in two weeks, we'll have our AS for Airplane activity at Ada Regional Airport with all the pre-K and kindergarten kids coming out there working with our senior students to learn parts of the airplane and getting to get in some of our training aircraft that they're doing flight lessons in. Um, but the plan is with this new grant, we have two smaller classrooms out in uh, our breezeway south of the main building of the high school. They were built in the 70s. They've kind of been sitting unused since I've been at the high school, which has been seven or eight years now. Um, but these, these rooms are sitting about 30 by 30. We'll tear down the wall between two of the rooms to create one larger space to implement the Tango flight curriculum. The idea is we've been really pushing the pilot pathway really hard and hitting some of the drone pathway, but to open up aviation as a whole, for all of our district students to kind of reach more students and push more students into our uh, aviation aerospace careers after they graduate high school. Um, again, what was kind of unique about, and I didn't even know this, uh, the breezeway rooms there at Ada High School, again, they were built in the late 70s by some of the students. So it kind of goes full circle where we're getting some kids back with some technical skills and abilities as they're graduating from high school. And I'm, I'll be here for any questions as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. I wonder if we could do that again, have kids build the classrooms. <laughs> uh, might be frowned upon a little bit in this day and age. I uh, believe uh, next up we have Atoka Public Schools uh, for $20,000. I don't know if we had a, oh, yes we do. Okay, very good. Morning, commissioners. I'm William Bram, the IT director at uh, Atoka Public Schools. David Swift is our STEM director. He was going to be here today, but due to some family emergencies, he had to step out, so I am taking his place today. I just want to say to Mr. Young, I had no idea we had uh, so many airports and airstrips that began with the letter C. Um, I was very shocked and surprised with that. So, uh, uh, but uh, on behalf of Atoka Public Schools, we want to say thank you very much for 
being considered for uh, this type of funding. Uh, we are a small school in comparison to most of the schools that may have been on this list. Uh, we're probably one of the smallest. Uh, but we are definitely seeking to pursue avenues in technology and aeronautics, aviation, uh, to be competing with some of our larger uh, school districts throughout the state. Uh, we want to show them that just because we're small, we are mighty indeed, and uh, we are continuing to do that, whether it's TSA, robotics, aeronautics, aviation, esports, those type of items that are normally uh, not in the limelight are quickly becoming the focal points of our school district. Um, it's no longer just Friday Night Lights, and so we're very, very happy to be a part of that. And again, we just want to say thank you for your consideration in this. Uh, this is going to allow us to actually uh, buy some furniture uh, and some storage, uh, storage space for our aviation programs, a new flight simulator as well that we're going to be adding to uh, our program there as well. So um, I won't take up any more of your time except to convey uh, Mr. Swift's great appreciation for this today. And uh, obviously, if you have any questions for me or our educational institute, please feel free to do so. But again, thank you today for your consideration. Good. Thank you, sir. Um, Obviously, we've got a, a larger program, smaller program, Ada and Atoka, uh, both doing great things in southeast Oklahoma. Uh, now we're going to transition to the northeast part of the state, and, and we'll call it the Tulsa metro area. But Bartlesville Public Schools, uh, $20,000 for their classroom lab improvement. And we, we have some folks from here from Bartlesville. Good morning. My name is Ashley Hightower, and I'm the aviation teacher at Bartlesville High School. And I'm here with my principal, Michael Harp, today to speak to you on behalf of our program. Uh, we're in the second year of our program teaching the AOPA You Can Fly curriculum. Mm -hmm. We have doubled the number of students from year one to year two with 86 kids currently in the program and we have 174 signed up for next year. Awesome. We will have the AOPA curriculum fully implemented by the 25-26 school year and we're adding the aviation maintenance pathway with Choose Aerospace starting next year. Our goals are to provide high quality aerospace and aviation education and learning opportunities for our kids, to prepare, prepare them to be career ready and develop uh, aerospace and aviation workers and leaders for Oklahoma's workforce in the future. The proposed upgrades in this grant will support these goals and modernize our aviation classroom and improve the quality of learning experiences. Our space is currently made up of two rooms built in 1939. One is a regular classroom with minimal storage space, and the other is a choir room with six three feet deep cement risers taking up the majority of the room. We are requesting funding to provide carpentry materials that will enable us to renovate the six risers into risers that are deeper and eventually be home to a flight simulator lab. And in the meantime, they will provide more workspace and allow us to be better organized with the addition of maker's tables, storage carts, and desk requested. It'll provide a smoother transition from one class to another. Our district has budgeted the required 20% match and will pay for the labor necessary to renovate. So thank you for considering our proposal and I believe the future of aviation at BHS and in Oklahoma is bright. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Bartlesville. Uh, next up, we have uh, Newcastle Public Schools for uh, $22,500. Uh, Newcastle's uh, another one of our newer schools that's uh, growing, uh, growing quite rapidly. Hi, good morning. I'm uh, Jordan Haitley. I'm the aviation instructor at Newcastle High School. First, we'll start by thanking uh, the commission for offering this grant to help uh, our schools and continue to offer aviation as a pathway for our students. Uh, as for Newcastle Aviation, we're closing out our first year teaching AOPA. We have 97 students in four sections of Aviation 1. Next year we'll be offering uh, three sections of Aviation 1, two sections of Aviation 2, and we also implemented this spring uh, the Choose Aerospace curriculum as well. Now next year, like I said, we'll be doing that. So we're fortunate to have started our program in the middle of a bond for new construction in Newcastle. So I inherited the uh, old band building. So you can imagine a band building, it's it built in 2005, so it's relatively new. But it's an open room, 25 foot ceilings, 2,400 square feet of floor space. We also inherited the hand-me-down library tables and chairs, which are very large and heavy. So it's an amazing space. We're able to fly drones inside completely regardless of weather. We don't have to go anywhere else. We have it all in our large room to do that. Uh, building our hot air balloons, anything like that, we can do all spread out on the space right there. 
Now with our plan to offer Aviation 1 and 2 next year, we'll be pivoting from one course to another rather rapidly and working on experiments in one class and then going back to lecture computer-based learning on the other. So there's a real need for speed in arranging the classroom to fit those requirements. Now that is where the laboratory tables and stools that we requested come into play. They have casters on them, allow us to move things rapidly around the classroom to give us the space that we need. Additionally, the tables that we asked for are uh, lab tables and are chemical and heat resistant, so they'll last for a long time. Now that large space that we have also poses a problem for accessing outlets, so we've requested retractable uh, outlet cord reels that will help students access power from up to 75 feet away and then reel that in quickly. Now with all of our materials for the AOP curriculum, we needed a way to organize that, so we requested shelving that's going to help us keep that uh, floor area safe and uh, clean. And with safety in mind, we also requested a flammable materials uh, cabinet to keep our uh, students safe and keep the building up to code for fire code. Uh, lastly, we currently have one Glime flight simulator set up for our 100 plus students that we'll be seeing. So the remaining uh, funds will be allocated to another simulator set up for learning. So I once again thank the Department of Aerospace and Aeronautics and continued investment in aviation in Oklahoma and our students' future. Thank you very much. Thank you, Newcastle. Uh, next up, we have uh, Rose State College. Uh, obviously, uh, Rose State uh, has a lot of aviation programs for their collegiate students, but they're also trying to support uh, many of the high schools around the area with teaching uh, AOPA and CHOOSE. So I believe we have some representative from Rose State here. Good morning, almost afternoon. Um, I'm Matt Weinrich. I am, came to aviation from being an athletic director, and I've become recently over the last three years obsessed with it. So um, as Rose State, we're not traditional pathway here. We are reaching out to other entities around us and we've gained quite a group of different people using our building. And our building is a, a 1960s elementary school that was decommissioned by Middell in 2011. <laughs> so I am in desperate need of tables, stools, and all multifunctional space to update my building and I'm just beyond grateful for the grant and um, in addition to the AOPA program we are also offering significant amount of after school and summer aviation based courses as well as our summer program now boasts about 3,000 student enrollments per summer so we're one of the largest summer camps in the uh, metro I would assume so thank you again okay. thanks Thank you, Rose State. Uh, and last but not least, we have uh, Wyandotte Public Schools. Uh, Wyandotte's one of our, our smaller uh, schools that offers the, the AOPA uh, and CHOOSE programs. So, uh, Wyandotte. Hi, I'm Dana Morissette, and I am uh, representing Wyandotte as the um, aviation administrator at our school. Um, I did jot down a few notes because, not because I needed to be reminded what to say, but so that I could scale down all of the excitement, enthusiasm that I have for the program. But I also want to kind of give you an idea of how we came to have kind of a little bit of a good problem to have when it came to our aviation program. Two years ago, well actually it was a little bit over two years ago, a uh, group, outside group, came to Wyandotte and proposed bringing an aviation academy to our area in the northeast Oklahoma, um, very northeast uh, corner of Oklahoma. With this uh, program, they had promised to bring a building and a modular building and a large monetary investment. As plans sometimes happen, and after a series of setback, those plans did not materialize, but we did have 42 students uh, from our 250 students uh, population signed up, excited, enthusiastic, and ready for, uh, to join our program. So what we did was we decided we were going to uh, utilize every resource that we had, which has been through the AOPA um, curriculum. Uh, we utilize the uh, Oklahoma Department of Aerospace and Aeronautics uh, grants. We have taken every opportunity that we can to utilize what we have available. Um, our program didn't just flounder, it has thrived. We have 52 this year, uh, this year uh, that are signed up and engaged. And then um, we have not gotten a total number, but I can tell you I'm already kind of dreading how we are going to house another 
the eighth grade group that are excited to come aboard next year as well. So I had to meet before uh, our school board because since the things that had been planned did not materialize, the board members uh, were concerned about the feasibility of sustaining our program. So I told them all of the things that became available and how we utilized them and the excitement that was garnered and they seized an opportunity and they uh, bought a building across the street from the high school. I would love to know what year that was built, but it was an old grocery store in Wyandotte and they have transformed it and we are thrilled to have a space that, to call our own and we are no longer nomads trying to find a building uh, or a room in whatever building we can find. So we converted the space and uh, it is functional, still a little bit makeshift, but functional. So you can imagine my enthusiasm when I was sitting at a high school basketball tournament and I opened my email and saw a classroom lab grant opportunity and I jumped on it. So I probably was a little bit overzealous, but uh, our program, we would like to be in uh, our space. We would like for it to represent our enthusiasm in our program and our pride in the program. And we would like uh, for it to be an exemplar to be used. We all already have uh, had three schools asked to come and see our program who are implementing their program new this year. We would like uh, lab tables so we don't have to go to the high school and schedule opportunities to go do some of our STEM labs. Um, we want shelving because we have no shelving or cabinets to put anything. Uh, we will make great use of the opportunity if, uh, as since we have been recommended, if so approved. We are so grateful for this opportunity. Our district is very committed to this program, uh, along with our board and myself especially, uh, because I brought a student with me. I wanted you to, to put a face to our program. If you'll stand up, please. This student is a freshman who has come to the program, and I will uh, speak for him. Not always the most enthusiastic of students, but he has been <laughs> one of our example. biggest. Uh, <laughs> he is who we go to for any uh, calibration of our simulators. We were uh, donated a uh, full motion Redbird simulator mm. uh, from a private uh, anonymous donation from our community with 11 hours on it. They, um, this young man is the one who takes care of all of that. Yes, uh, they, wanted, they wanted to promote the aviation program, but we didn't even have a building. So this is why we got busy and we got us a building. This young man um, is my personal commitment because he's my son. If we would have asked, <laughs> if I'd asked him to join this program, that would not have happened, but uh, he is obsessed and we are we could not be more excited he plans to go through the military and be a pilot so super super excited and we just want to tell you how much we appreciate all of the help and the accessibility we have to these people who help us and we look forward to wind up becoming an aviation and aerospace mecca so just saying <laughs> thank you thank you sitting back there going mom I can't believe you said that about Thank you, Wyandotte. Um, so uh, before you are the, the six recommended programs and the dollar values you see on the screen, um, we will have uh, safeguards in place to ensure that uh, should something really tragic happen and a school no longer uh, want to uh, offer the program after we've uh, been into one year, we'll, we'll have an opportunity to claw those monies back at a, at a pro rata share, uh, or if we bought physical infrastructure that's movable, i.e. a simulator or something else, uh, we'll bring that back and reallocate it uh, around the state. So we do have some safeguards in place. Uh, staff recommends approval for this slate of six, and uh, I am eager to see if we can uh, be successful and then maybe recreate this program again uh, for another round in the next budget cycle. So I'll stand for any additional questions or our members will have answer any questions that I may not be able to do so. Any questions about these applications? Motion to approve. No, second. Second. Yeah. All right, with a motion and a second, uh, call the roll, please. Commissioner Phillips. Yes. Vice Chair Rainey. Aye. Commissioner Putnam. Aye. Commissioner Hunter. Aye. Thank you. Okay, motion passes. Uh, thank you, Director. Next up is item number 15, administrative rules, Michelle. Okay. 
The Commission will consider approving the recommended changes to the agency's administrative rules regarding Title 25. These changes incorporate the agency name change per the requirements set forth in Senate Bill 782 and clarify the operational difference of Commission and Department throughout the title. Additional changes include updating the airport construction program projects, funding information, clarifying fuel system project qualifications, updating airport sponsor assurances, adding airport compliance information, and updates on when an APA permit is not required to be filed. Um, as far as specifics with regards to the fuel systems, department's maximum cost share shall be 50% and shall not exceed 300,000, which we had, but it's now defined as per system type and per fuel type. Um, as far as the new assurance, um, state of the airport sponsor will take appropriate action to the furthest extent, including potential land acquisition to restrict use of land adjacent or in the immediate vicinity of the airport to activities compatible with normal operation and that an airport sponsor must take necessary action to ensure that terminal airspace as is required to protect instrument and visual operations, otherwise mitigating existing airport hazards and prevention of the creation of new airport hazards. We've also added a um, new airport compliance and our goal is to use the most effective means to maintain airports in full compliance of grant assurance requirements. Airports must comply with all grant assurances and remain to remain eligible for grant funding from the department. And when the department is working to correct a grant assurance violation, the department may elect to move the airport status to conditional compliance. Conditional compliance means an airport may continue to receive grant funding and does not necessitate the immediate rem removal of any currently awarded funding provided the airport is complying and actively working to correct the problem or the violation. Uh, the Commission may elect to move an airport status to non-compliance if a grant assurance is violated. With regards to the airport um, or the aerospace and aviation education grant program, we have included um, a start date of the program has been defined now and it also indicates that any costs incurred prior to the start date are no longer or are not eligible. We didn't specifically have that in the rule, we've actually added that now. We've been running that way without the. <laughs> and then finally, with APA, additional clarity has been given on who is not required to file a permit. So those are the primary changes. Um, I think you guys have them in your packet as well. Um, I'll stand for any questions. If there are none, we are recommending approval. Any questions? No. Do we have a motion to approve these changes to our administrative rules? I shall move. Second. Any Thank discussion? You. Call the roll, please. Commissioner Phillips. Yes. <clears throat> Vice Chair Rainey. Aye. Commissioner Putnam. Aye. Commissioner Hunter. Aye. Motion passes. Okay, thank you, Michelle. The uh, Now for item 16, director's report. Director Artis. All right, uh, seeing that we are uh, coming up on the noon hour here fairly quick, I will try and make my uh, director's report as uh, expedient as possible. Um, a and B, uh, it is uh, that time of year, uh, legislative uh, session is, is going on, so that means everybody has to have their legislative receptions. Uh, ODIA uh, had theirs, as well as the state chamber uh, in back-to-back -back weeks, um, had uh, good conversations. Uh, several of the staff attended uh, ODIA, uh, and I know Sandra and I were at the, the state chamber um, just talking about the upcoming legislative session. That first month in February is, uh, is, is pretty wild uh, in terms of uh, the conversations and how fast a pace it, it is going. And that was probably the key topic of, of a lot of the conversations was, my gosh, uh, how, how are you surviving and, and how are you handling how fast this is going? So uh, moving on to item C, um, there in that third week in February, some of our uh, friends from AAR uh, came in uh, and advocated uh, on our behalf for, for our aero education efforts, uh, but also just uh, representing and, and putting faces with names for AAR with our legislative leaders. Uh, you see uh, Walter Wright there on the right and Ryan Gertzen there on the left, Walter White being their DC, uh, head of government affairs, and, and uh, Ryan Gertzen their head of uh, talent development there uh, on the left uh, in that uh, top picture. 
with uh, pro tem designate uh, McCourtney. Uh, that's, 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 that's a tough one there, uh, Sandra. Got to get that pro tem, uh, Senate pro tem designate uh, McCourtney. And then obviously uh, Speaker Charles McCall uh, and several other representatives and legislators. Uh, so good meeting there. And, and I know uh, they're appreciative of Sanders' efforts to schedule those meetings for them. Uh, followed that up uh, with a uh, planning and hangar development conversation um, with uh, our friends at Woodring. Uh, I was originally planning to be there in person, but unfortunately the Capitol was calling, and so we had to uh, have that discussion virtually, but uh, had a good conversation with the airport, their consultant, and the planning consultant uh, on, on some of the uh, open acreage that uh, Woodring has and how we can better take advantage of that for uh, aviation business growth uh, and development. Uh, followed that on with the uh, last week. I was uh, wandering around our great country. Uh, started off in uh, Fort Worth for our uh, FAA Southwest Airports Partnership Conference. Uh, you see there in the picture that's me and our uh, fellow state aviation directors in our region, along with uh, FAA Regional Administrator Rob Lowe. Uh, we had a brief, brief discussion there about what's happening in our states uh, before uh, moving on to uh, D.C which was the uh, rest of the week. Uh, many of us went straight to D.C. for our NASEO Washington conference where we were talking about all things up on Capitol Hill, uh, FAA reauthorization, uh, FY24 budget, as well as the FY25 budget, uh, and getting that thing started. Uh, so uh, great conversation. I met with uh, six of the seven uh, offices um, that uh, represent Oklahoma's federal delegation. Uh, I only got to meet with me with a couple of members uh, as they were passing budgets uh, on uh, Thursday and trying to get out of town and come back to the state. Uh, so I got to meet with a handful of the actual members, but had good conversations with their staff and uh, talked to them about Oklahoma priorities and, and how we are there to, to help as there's a few new, new faces on, on the staff level uh, for our congressional offices. But overall, by and large, great support uh, for aviation aerospace and, and the work that the department's doing. Uh, and the work that our airports and our aviation communities are doing across the state of Oklahoma. But that stands for my director's report. I'll uh, be here for any questions or comments you may have. Questions, comments? No, good. Good. All right. Item number 17, concluding remarks regarding agenda items. I'll entertain any remarks at this time. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the conversation and uh, apologize for my tardiness. Uh, we'll try and uh, Deconflict that in the future uh, with uh, what's happening at the Capitol, but sometimes uh, I can't be in two places at once. So I, that's my only concluding remark, uh, Commissioners. I think it's, it's exciting to see all the artwork today and so many of the young students that just these high schools are really just blowing up. You know, it's uh, Oklahoma is a special place for aviation, so it's going to be exciting in the next few years to see how our state continues to grow in that area. So. I'm, I'm excited about the amount of STEM education, the AOPA curricula that you two ladies are getting on. It's, it's amazing. And all the folks at, uh, at the schools who are embracing it, it it's really encouraging. It's uh, exciting. Okay, item number 18, announcement of our next meeting. Our next meeting will be 10 a.m. on Wednesday, May 15, 2024, here in the first uh, floor conference room at the Oklahoma Department of Transportation. Director Artie's, uh, for item 19, is there any new business? No new business, sir. Okay, if hearing none, we'll move on to item 12, adjournment. Is there a motion to adjourn? I so move. I hear a second. Second, second. Okay, with a second, I declare this meeting adjourned. Thank you.